Muy buenas tardes. Tras el parón estival, arranca ahora la última etapa del ciclo de conferencias El Museo y Mañana, de la Cátedra del Museo del Prado, dirigida por Filipe de Montebello. Hoy tenemos la satisfacción de contar con el doctor Thomas Campbell, recientemente nombrado director del Museo Metropolitano de Nueva York, a quien me gustaría, en primer lugar, agradecer, en nombre de todos, el esfuerzo que realiza al estar hoy con nosotros dentro de estos primeros y, me imagino, complejos meses de, de su mandato. De la calidad como investigador y conservador del doctor Campbell, tuvimos noticias en nuestro país con motivo de la presentación de la extraordinaria exposición sobre los tapices barrocos que se celebró en el Palacio Real hace año y medio y de la que fue comisario. De hecho, es el ámbito de investigación sobre tapices y textiles y su relación con las demás artes lo que ha definido su trayectoria académica y profesional hasta ahora. Nacido y criado en Oxford, ciudad en la que estudió la licenciatura en Filología y Literatura Inglesa, Thomas Campbell más tarde obtuvo su doctorado en el Curso Institute of Art de, de Londres con una inédita investigación acerca de un aspecto de la historia del arte hasta entonces muy pasado por alto, el papel preponderante que llevó a jugar el tapiz en el arte europeo, tanto como disciplina artística como medio de propaganda. Sus estudios y publicaciones sobre la corte de Enrique VIII y el patronazgo real durante el Renacimiento y Barroco han sido seminales, así como el impulso con el que lideró la creación del, del Frances Archivo de Tapices en Londres, que con eh, 12.000 imágenes es actualmente el mayor centro de información sobre tapices y textiles europeos. En el Metropolitan Museum of Art y inicia su andadura hace 14 años, concretamente en 1995, como ayudante de conservación en el Departamento de Escultura Europea y Artes Decorativas, llegando a ocupar el puesto de conservador de dicho departamento en 2003. En este tiempo ha liderado algunos de los proyectos expositivos más fascinantes y de mayor reclamo popular de los últimos años, como son la muestra dedicada al, al, al tapiz del Renacimiento en 2002, o hilos de esplendor, tapices del barroco al que me he referido, que se inauguró en Nueva York en el 2007 y que recaló, como decía, en Madrid, que tuvo un extraordinario éxito. Entre sus responsabilidades en el museo ha estado, además, la colosal gestión de la colección de 36.000 piezas que conforma el Centro de Textiles Antonio Ratti de dicha institución, seguramente el centro de estudios textiles más importantes del mundo, sin olvidar sus múltiples y reconocidas contribuciones al estudio de las artes decorativas. Hoy su función, eh, su misión dentro de la institución es diferente y es de esto de lo que nos viene a hablar. El Metropolitan de Nueva York no solo es uno de los grandes museos universales, ha sido y es un ejemplo del funcionamiento, del cumplimiento de la misión de conservación y educación del, de un museo, como se suele decir, un modelo, ¿no? y su futuro nos implica, nos implica a todos. Por este motivo, nos tenemos que sentir hoy privilegiados al contar con la presencia de su nuevo director, quien nos acerca a él a través de las ideas e impresiones que tiene sobre el presente y futuro de nuestras instituciones en estos tiempos de, de cambio. Antes de cederle la palabra, quisiera desearle toda la suerte y el éxito que se merece en su gestión y recordarle la siempre dispuesta colaboración de este museo y con el que nos sentimos eh, plenamente ligados. Tiene la palabra el, el doctor Campbell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening at the invitation of Philippe de Montebello and under the auspices of the Prado. I can think of no more appropriate institution at which to give my first uh, European lecture uh, as in my new role as director of the Metropolitan. The subject of my discussion this evening is the exhibition program at the Metropolitan, past, present, and future. 
When I applied to join the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1994 as an assistant curator of textiles, the culmination of the interview process was a meeting with Philippe de Montebello, then the director, in his office overlooking Fifth Avenue. I don't remember much about the exchange, except for one moment. After a fairly straightforward conversation about my background, experience, and current research, Philippe asked me what I would most like to do if I came to the Metropolitan. In reply, I told him I wanted to organize an exhibition of Renaissance tapestries. My goal was to demonstrate that the tapestry medium reached its apogee during the 16th century and did not go into immediate decline at the end of the medi medieval era, uh, the misleading paradigm that had influenced so much of 20th century art history. This moment in the interview was, I suspect, uh, the, the deciding moment. Philippe had studied some 16th century French tapestries himself as a student, so he was sympathetic to the idea. But more important, the notion of a groundbreaking exhibition that would be both spectacular and scholarly is a formula that has lain at the heart of the Metropolitan's psyche for many years. In focusing on this aspect of the museum's activity, I was conforming with a paradigm of curatorial activity that is central, that has become central to the museum's mission. I should emphasize, I wasn't giving this answer to please the hearer. It was, quite genuinely, the thought of organizing large exhibitions that had attracted me to a career at the Metropolitan above all others. I had spent several months at the Metropolitan as a researcher in the early 1990s and had come to realize that its exhibition program surpassed anything that I had encountered in European museums, partly in terms of the number of exhibitions mounted each year, partly the size of the galleries in which those exhibitions were presented, partly the level of funding available to support those exhibitions, partly the scholarship that the shows embodied, and equally importantly, the sophisticated audiences that flocked to every exhibition and were so engaged by them. As I have subsequently learned, I was not mistaken in drawing these conclusions. Since its foundation in 1870, the Metropolitan Museum has featured more than 2,000 exhibitions and installations. In the last decade alone, it has opened an average of 35 shows each year. The combination of the volume of exhibitions and related scholarly publications is without comparison anywhere in the world. Yet, despite all the success of this program, or perhaps because of it, we now stand at a crossroads, or certainly a moment of profound reflection. Because the economic circumstances that have overtaken the Metropolitan Museum and other American cultural institutions in the last 12 months, since, I mean, literally after my appointment, are forcing us to ask some fundamental questions about the very raison d'etre of our exhibition program and of our broader mission, and the extent to which we can and should maintain such a level of activity in the future. So in the course of my lecture this evening, I want to talk about the development of this program over the years, the way in which it has helped the museum grow its collections, the way it has helped grow the perception of the museum, and literally to form the psyche of the museum. The, Metropol the Metropolitan Museum was incorporated in 1870 with a stated mission to encourage and develop the study of the fine arts, to encourage the application of the arts to manufacture and practical life, and to furnish popular instruction. Here, we see a slide of the first building in Central Park, dating from about 1880. During its formative years, many of its early special exhibitions were assemblages of loaned objects from the private collections of museum trustees. Many of these subsequently entered the museum's collection. 
For example, an exhibition held in 1888 to celebrate the opening of the new South Wing, which we see here, featured old master paintings from the collection of the president, Henry Marcond, and Henry Havemeyer, the sugar merchant. 52 of Marcond's paintings subsequently entered the collection, including these famous portraits of Fra Filippo Lippi on the left and Van Dyck on the right. These loan exhibitions took on a new scale in 1909, at the time of the commemorations held to celebrate the 300th anniversary of Henry Hudson's exploration of the river that, later, that was later named for him, the Hudson River. The Metropolitan's contribution to the festivities was an exhibition composed of over 100 17th century Dutch paintings and a major showing of American paintings, furniture, and industrial arts. The exhibition was viewed by 300,000 visitors and was a watershed moment with respect to the museum's engagement with citywide cultural events. <coughs> to document the show, the museum produced its largest and most lavishly illustrated catalogue up to that time. Many of the old masters in the exhibition subsequently again came to the Met, particularly those of the famous Benjamin Altman collection, which included masterpieces by Vermeer, Velasquez, and Rembrandt. Here we see one of, one of the Vermeers. In addition, the exhibition marked the point at which the museum began to seriously collect and study American painting and decorative arts. Here we see the pavilion of that subject matter from that exhibition. The most influential collector involved with the Metropolitan during these early years was the New York financier and museum president, John Pierpoint Morgan. Morgan's collection, considered among the greatest of its time, was divided between America and Europe. But in 1909, the US government removed the existing tariff on imported art, and Morgan was finally in a position to bring his collection back from Europe. Here we see a, a cartoon published in Puck magazine at the time, the magnetic, magnetic power of the American dollar. Some of Morgan's paintings and old master drawings had already been on display at the museum, but they were now joined by 4,000 more objects representing the decorative arts from antiquity to modern times. The complete exhibition was installed in chronological arrangement in a new wing Many pieces had never been displayed in the United States before, and the show received wide acclaim. Morgan bequeathed the collection to his son, John, John Pierpoint Morgan Jr., who in turn gave many valuable objects to the museum, a further demonstration, if one is needed, of the way that these early exhibitions contributed to the formation of the museum's core collections. The museum's founding charter enshrined education for the masses at the core of its activities. But during the first decades of its existence, it was, in many respects, a rather elite club for its membership. Things were changing, however. After years of discussion in 1889, the museum finally started opening for the public on Sundays, the day when, in fact, many laborers, the only day they could go and attendance steadily rose in the early years of the century, fueled in part by exhibitions like the Hudson exhibition I've just mentioned. The museum's 1911 annual report commented proudly that the museum no longer, quote, no longer appeals merely to the upper classes, end quote, but had achieved a more broad audience, and that its growth had become symmetrical, embracing all art of all periods. Of course, the educational mission was a convenient way of leveraging funding from the city, which according to the terms of the founding charter, was responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of the buildings. This educational mission took on a fresh meaning during the First World War, when the disarray of European industry presented American manufacturers with opportunities to expand production. 
the museum began concentrated efforts to mount exhibitions aimed at influencing contemporary industrial design. For example, a costume and textile show organized in 1915 to 16 featured material ranging from ancient Peru to medieval Europe to modern day Japan. It was organized with the specific intention of stimulating the New York fashion trade and became the prototype for a long running series of contemporary American industrial art exhibitions that lasted into the 1940s. These didactic exhibitions, here's another slide of that fashion show. These didactic exhibitions coexisted with a continuing succession of small shows featuring different aspects of the museum's collections. Everything from Japanese arms and armor to European lace and occasional exhibits of old master and American painters. One aspect that is notably lacking during these years though is any treatment of modern art. Although the Metropolitan certainly exhibited and acquired works by contemporary artists, American artists, from early in its history, they were largely establishment figures working in the academic tradition. But the art movements that developed in reac reaction to that tradition received little attention at the Met during the first 50 years of its existence despite the wave of Salon des Refusés exhibitions that swept Europe and America in the early 1910s. Indeed, it was in reaction to the conservative taste of the Metropolitan's trustees and senior staff that the Museum of Modern Art was to be formed in New York in 1937. The situation began to change at the Met in 1940 with the appointment as director of Francis Henry Taylor, an innovator with a touch of the showman about him. The first major exhibit of modern American art was precipitated by the Second World War when many of the museum's treasures were removed to a heavily guarded estate near Philadelphia for safekeeping. Taking advantage of the empty galleries in 1942, Taylor organized an, ex an exhibition titled Artists for Victory, which featured works by living artists. Total attendance for this groundbreaking display exceeded 300,000, and the mostly positive reaction helped propel the Met into greater engagement with, if not contemporary art, at least early modern. I should say, the definition of, of modern art remained very uh, uh, behind the times. Encouraged by the response to the exhibition, which we see another slide here, the trustees purchased two Van Goghs, cypresses and sunflowers, and they even agreed to hold a Van Gogh exhibition. While this was hardly showcasing the true avant-garde of the day, it was as far as the museum was yet prepared to tread. If the Met was slow to engage with modern art, it embraced another European innovation more readily. During the 1930s, a number of large international art loan exhibitions had been held in Paris and London. And it was again the Second World War that precipitated American museums into similar international collaborations. The first of these shows actually took place at the National Gallery in Washington, when several hundred old master paintings from the Berlin Museums recovered by American forces in 1945 from the Nazis, were sent for safekeeping to the United States. The decision to bring the paintings here was somewhat controversial. Critics feared that the Allies were themselves attempting to profit from the war by removing beauty, booty from Europe to America. But the Washington show eventually took place and was enormously successful being visited by nearly a million people in its run. Subsequently, a smaller version of the show opened at the Met in 1948 and then circulated through the United States uh, before the paintings were returned to their true homes. Just before that though, the Met had been host to its own international loan show, an exhibition of a subject dear to my heart, 200 
of the finest examples of medieval, renaissance, and modern tapestries from France. Organized by Pierre Vallet of the Louvre in 1946 to 47, the exhibition was regarded as the most notable art loan from Europe ever to go to an American museum, as we see from this contemporary newspaper. The exhibition was celebrated as an act of diplomacy, and the New York arrival of the collection on a French warship was marked by a disembarkation ceremony attended by museum staff and government dignitaries. The tapestries, none of which had previously been exhibited in the States, were installed in 24 galleries of the museum's north wing. Here we see the famous Angers apocalypse, dating from about 1400. To defray the cost of the exhibition, this was one of the first exhibitions for which the museum charged an entry fee, the grand sum of 30 cents. And here we see the famous Clooney unicorn tapestries. <clears throat> The tapestry exhibition was shortly followed by another exhibit of treasures from the Vienna museums. The age of the international loan show had dawned, and from the late 1940s, the Metropolitan Directors began to be increasingly involved in discussions and exchanges with their European counterparts. One of the most famous of these efforts took place in 1963, when the Mona Lisa was lent to the American people by the government of the French Republic as a gesture of friendship and diplomacy. After the painting's initial exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington, it arrived at the Met with its own Secret Service security detail. Despite winter conditions, visitors came en masse and the line at times stretched several city blocks. Once inside, Visitors were ushered past the Mona Lisa and were encouraged not to stop in front of the painting. The volume of visit viewers necessitated an extension of hours for the month of the exhibition, and the final visitor count was, more, was over one million people. The exhibition advanced the Metropolitan's vision of public art education and was considered successful, though the large volume of visitors minimized the educational experience. Irrespective of this, the sheer number of visitors provided the museum with an important new tool in the ongoing struggle to obtain funding from the city. Questioned by a reporter as to the value of the exhibition, James Rorimer, the then director, was explicit about the motivation for such a show. Quote, the public will be more interested in voting for state aid to museums. Cities will more willingly support cultural undertakings." End quote. Rorimer's words reflect a manner of thinking that was taking hold in the management of American museums. During the 1960s and 1970s, large exhibitions were to become a key component of museum business plans and marketing strategies and the Metropolitan was in the forefront of this development. In a large part, this was due to Thomas Hoving, who succeeded Jim Rorimer in 1967. Hoving began his career at the Metropolitan, actually at the Cloisters, but subsequently he became the commissioner for the New York City Parks, a role in which he drew much attention to himself. His detractors accused him of being publicity crazed, and his appointment to the directorship at the Metropolitan was somewhat controversial from the start, though the trustees could not have dreamed of how controversial it was to become. Hoving's first task at the Metropolitan was to organize at short notice a show to fill a gap in the schedule formed by the postponement of another exhibition. Titled, In the Presence of Kings, Royal Treasures from the Collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The exhibition was drawn almost entirely from the Met's own collection and included more than 600 objects spanning 5,000 years of the world's uh, civilizations. Through intense collaboration between the designers, many curatorial departments, and construction staff, the show was assembled in less than three months 
really rather extraordinary. Here we see images of the show being put together. Things for Kings, as it was nicknamed, was considered Hoving's debut as director. The exhibition was lauded for its then experimental thematic approach to the permanent collection and for its innovative design, which, in, which included curved walls, niches, custom pedestals, and dramatic lighting. All, of course, the staple of modern exhibitions. Not all of Hoving's innovations were so successful. Two years later, in 1969, he presided over the opening of Harlem On My Mind, undoubtedly the most controversial exhibition in the museum's history. This was a guest curated show of photographs, films, sound recordings, and memorabilia that attempted to convey the total environment of Harlem from 1900 to 1968. Hoving viewed it as, quote, a turning point, the first major step toward rethinking and expanding our concept of what exhibitions should do, end quote. The intention was to promote dialogue on significant social and political issues, to engage the African-American community, and to broaden the museum's audience. The exhibition achieved these goals, but in ways that Hoving and museum trustees did not entirely expect. Black artists groups picketed the museum for excluding them from planning and representation in the show. Artworks in other museum galleries were vandalized an essay in the original exhibition catalog was attacked as racist, racist and partly plagiarized and had to be entirely withdrawn from circulation. And some critics panned the show. But from an attendance standpoint, bad news is good news. The show was an unqualified success with a door count of over 400,000. Hoving also brought fresh energy, energy to the Metropolitan's engagement with contemporary art. In 1967, he appointed a young critic called Henry Geldzahler as the new head of the modern art department. Geldzahler's first big project was an exhibition which took place in 1969, titled New York Painting and Sculpture, 1940 to 1970. Incorporating more than 400 works by 43 artists, Henry's show, generated tremendous interest. According to the uh, official historian of the Met, Calvin Tompkins, the opening night was a, gla a glamorous circus with people dressed up in the most wild, see-through outfits and pot smoke wafting through the galleries. The selection of artists, many of them Geldzahler's close personal associates, sparked controversy and even public protest. An effigy of Henry was burned outside the museum on the opening night, and the critic, Hilton Kramer, wrote that it would bring lasting discredit on the Met's standards of judgment. But the exhibition was pivotal in stimulating debate regarding the significance of artists from the New York School, and it levered the Metropolitan into the contemporary art scene from which the institution had been largely absent for decades. Meanwhile, as another historian of the museum, Michael Gross, has recently commented, Hoving realized that the more the museum was criticized, the more the crowds streamed in. By the mid-70s, the scale and variety of exhibitions that has characterized the Metropolitan's museum program over the last 30 years was well established. For example, 1975 began with a show celebrating the 100th birthday of Impressionism, which was followed by exhibits of Japanese art, Francis Bacon, Scythian gold from the Soviet Union, the opening of the Lehman Pavilion, and a scholarly exhibit of French paintings organized in conjunction with the Louvre. The Impressionism exhibition was an unprecedented success, attracting 500,000 visitors in 10 weeks although the critic, Hilton Kramer, once again, attacked Hoving for succumbing to box office mentality and, quote, 
compromising standards of scholarly integrity in the interest of crowd-pleasing spectacles, end quote. The Scythian Gold Show, which I'm showing a second slide here, uh, which took place in 1975, was innovative in another respect. Featuring objects excavated from underground tombs located north of the Black Sea, this was a pivotal demonstration of the role that the federal government might play in providing insurance for overseas loan exhibitions. The Met had been lobbying Washington since 1972 for the creation of a government-backed indemnity program, and the Scythian Show became the first test case, being awarded a one-time congressional legislation to ensure the works of art in transit. The Soviet government reciprocated by indemnifying American and European paintings that were sent overseas in exchange. And the success of this two-way effort paved the way for the establishment later in 1975 of a permanent indemnity program managed by the National Endowment for the Arts. Since that time, the indemnity program has ensured nearly 900 exhibitions several do in America, several dozen of them at the Metropolitan, saving hundreds of millions of dollars for the museums in insurance premiums. Another of the innovations that occurred under Thomas Hoving were the annual costume exhibitions organized by Diana Vreeland, the curator of the Costume Institute. These started in 1974, and during the following years, they were to become a crucial component in the museum's fundraising efforts because of the crowds that they attracted and the glamorous parties that were associated with the openings and which were marketed as fundraising events. Vreeland's exhibitions were totally unscholarly, but they had enormous flair and media savvy, as, for example, the glory of Russian costume organized in 1975, for which Jackie Onassis, the, the president's uh, wife, helped negotiate the loans from Russia, or Manchu Dragon, Manchu Dragon, Costumes of China, the, the title says it all, doesn't it, uh, of 1980, which we see here, with sort of fabulous disco mirrored pillars and um, wild face masks. But Vreeland's close involvement with the commercial world drew much criticism, as, for example, the 1978 book Selling Culture by Deborah Silverman, which was a scathing critique of Vreeland, the museum, and the media in which it operated. Hoving left the Metropolitan Museum in 1977 to be succeeded by Philippe de Montebello, who obviously needs no introduction in this context. Philippe's first year was dominated by the final ambitious project that Hoving had coordinated, the Treasures of Tutankhamun. This Met organized traveling exhibition of Egyp Egyptian tomb treasures included the Boy King's solid gold funeral mask and a variety of lamps, carvings, jars, jewelry, and other objects uh, for the afterlife. It toured seven US museums during 1977 to 79, attracting over eight million visitors, and set the modern standard for a blockbuster exhibition. The installation recreated the initial discovery of the dark tomb entrance and storage areas by presenting the objects in approximately the same order in which they were found. Photo murals of 1922 excavation scenes and contemporary newspaper accounts evoked the excitement of the discovery. <coughs> Philippe's appointment as director signaled a retreat from the showy extravagance and publicity stunts of Hoving's directorship. And in the coming years, the Metropolitan was to craft a more nuanced balance between business realities and scholarly mission. But the roster of major international loan exhibitions continued unabated. During the late 70s and 80s, 
the Met hosted many groundbreaking exhibitions of European art. Here, we see images of the 1983 Vatican Collections exhibition, the first major loan of Vatican art to be sent overseas, which featured world-famous works of mosaic, fresco, tapestry, sculpture, and painting, spanning from antiquity to the 20th century. Of course, this is not how people saw it. To support the cost of the exhibition, special admission was charged and all 600,000 tickets sold out. Alongside exhibitions of European and American art, the museum continued the program of shows introducing less familiar arts and cultures that Hoving had inaugurated with the Scythian Gold and King Tut exhibitions. In 1985, India, exclamation mark, became the first international exhibition devoted to the art of the subcontinent. It gave the staff a new level of experience in dealing with diverse, fragile materials traveling great distances. Similarly, the 1991 exhibition, Mexico, Splendors of 30 Centuries, was among the most complicated undertakings by the Metropolitan up to that date. Focusing on pre-Columbian sites, the largest object weighed 8,000 pounds. The catalog also remains one of the weightiest books on Mexican art published in English. While each of these exhibitions was exceptional in its own way, they were but a small part of a total number of exhibitions mounted during the 1980s and 1990s. Indeed, the number of exhibitions that the Met mounted each year has steadily increased. During the 1970s, we mounted an average of 25 exhibitions and installations each year. In the 1980s, that number rose to 28. I show uh, some of the, the changing banners on the facade of the museum from the 80s. In the 1990s, the number rose to 37 each year. Here we have, again, images from the 1990s. And in the early 2000s, uh, sorry, we rose 28 to 35 to 37. <clears throat> Last year, it was 40. There you see the, the new banners that were introduced about four, three years ago as a result of the cleaning of the facade. Less theatrical than the enormous ones, but um, considerably cheaper and they allow you to actually see the, the architecture. One of the driving forces behind this increase in the number of exhibitions um, has been the growth of the museum itself. Philippe de Montebello's tenure coincided with the realization of the master plan that Hoving had negotiated with the city for the museum back in the 1970s when he, he uh, reached an agreement to massively extend the footprint of the museum. Here we see the museum before the building, before the master plan, and completed in 1991, there is the museum as it now exists today. Along with the physical growth of the museum, there has been an enormous increase in the number of staff which has approximately doubled since the 1970s. In 1985, Philippe appointed Marouk Tarapour, I know a good friend of, 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 of many of you here in, at the Prado, um, as a special assistant to the director for exhibitions. And subsequently, she became the associate director for exhibitions. Since the mid-1980s, Marouk played a key role in negotiating loans and developing relationships with sister institutions all over the world. Her appointment was but one that was but the most visible manifestation of the growth of the museum's staff in order to service the enormous volume of exhibitions. Quite apart from the curatorial expertise involved, our larger exhibitions typically engage more than 100 museum staff in the course of their execution including lawyers, fundraisers, 
special event planners, communications officers, editors and production staff, website staff, registrars, designers, conservators, installers, riggers, and so on. Here we see uh, images of the uh, transportation of some of the tapestries for my 2002 uh, Renaissance tapestry show in through the front door of the Metropolitan. If I think these, these might have been Prado, uh, uh, Patrimonio tapestries, which were too big to go internally through the museum. While the number of exhibitions has kept growing, the program has changed in other ways. Although our attendance has ridly, risen steadily over the decades, now averaging approximately 4.8 million visitors per year, an analysis of the door count for the most highly attended exhibitions between 1961 and 2009 demonstrates a steady decline in the numbers attending the larger shows. From seven to 800,000 in the 1970s to just over 400,000 in the early 2000s. Various factors account for this, of which the most significant is probably the, the attention, uh, the fact that the attention generated around single exhibitions in the 1970s is almost impossible now because of the number of competing attractions, both in New York and other American museums. And perhaps there is an element of audience fatigue. Visitors no longer flock automatically to see Scythian or Bactrian hordes, whereas gold once lured thousands, no matter where the material originated. I should note that I am not decrying this drop in attendance for such exhibitions. After all, who can enjoy a show when you're trying to see over the shoulders of 25 people in front of you? The character of our exhibitions has also changed in other ways. The phenomenon of the blockbuster was being questioned even by Thomas Hoving in the early 1970s, uh, who wrote that we, we, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to sustain such large international loan shows. Well, while he was certainly um, jumping the gun in predicting that, it is true that the buzz and revenue that big exhibitions had generated in the 1970s fed an expectation that was hard to sustain. During the 1980s, Philippe steered the museum's marketing efforts towards an approach that was grounded on a more scholarly basis. As the communications officer, Harold Holzer, has commented to me, quote, we came to take pride in and boast about the fact that our schedule was crafted by the director and by the curators and was aimed at widening the public's knowledge of art history, not feeding into fads and the all too familiar. We made this into a virtue and it has remained one since. Variety in genre, period and cultural origins is the greatest thing about the Met's exhibition schedule. The purity of the creative curatorial mission is actually a strong selling point, end quote. An attendant manifestation of this increasing emphasis on scholarship was the caliber of the books that were published in association with the Met's exhibitions. Here we see just an array, array of a fraction of the exhibition catalogs published over the last 30 years that was a part of the the exhibition celebrating uh, Philippe's directorship held last year. Catalogues of the mid 20th century were little more than checklists, but during the late 60s and 70s, they acquired greater weight physically and intellectually. And over the last 30 years, I think it is true to say that the Met's exhibition catalogues embody one of the largest and most significant sources of high quality art history publications in the world. And of course, many of them are printed here in Madrid by El Viso. This production is sustained in part by the sales that can be guaranteed at the exhibition itself, and in part by generous grants from foundations. 
The net result is that we are able to publish exhibition catalogues on esoteric subjects for which there would otherwise be no ready market. That's certainly the case, for example, with my own two uh, tapestry exhibition catalogues, where the exhibition provided a way of leveraging a publication that would otherwise have been untenable in commercial terms. Another factor that has played a critical part in the character of the exhibition program at the Met over the last two decades has been the extent to which Philippe encouraged and supported initiatives that were proposed to him by the curatorial staff. With 17 curatorial departments and more than 140 curators, the Met is a fertile ground for the inception of such ideas. Finally, it should be noted that the Met has been supremely successful in fundraising for its exhibition program. Emily Rafferty, the current president, was for many years the head of our development office, and in her tenure, the museum led the field in obtaining sponsorship from corporate and private sponsors. And thus, the exhibition program has been sustained over the last two, three decades. With the completion of the master plan in 1991, the museum now has three enormous exhibition halls for big exhibitions. Uh, the oh, the so-called Cantor Galleries and the Tisch Gallery in the Wallace Wing, which are essentially huge empty spaces that can be adapted as we like. And the B Galleries adjacent to our European paintings, uh, which are not quite so adaptable, but still provide a great space for um, a variety of exhibitions. And it's in these spaces that we've mounted such shows as Splendors of Imperial China in 1996, which brought together 450 objects from the National Museum in Taipei. It was a huge public success, perhaps in part because the week before the show opened, uh, China fired missiles at um, Taiwan, giving us a real boost in the newspapers. Um, the Jackie Kennedy costume show of 2001, which became a shrine for every loyal American. Here we see the queues again down Fifth Avenue. Scholarly shows such as Manny Velasquez of 2003. Or incredibly ambitious shows like the recent Byzantium Faith and Power of 2004. This was a third in a triptych of Byzantium exhibitions um, and involved loans from 100 institutions in 25 countries. Most memorable were the uh, icons that had never previously left the Greek Orthodox monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai, Egypt. And the, and the exhibition also included for the first time loans from countries that had previously been in the, uh, the Soviet orbit, uh, Serbia, Macedonia, and Romania. And this was a show in which uh, Marouk, in particular, was involved in literally a couple of years of incredibly complex negotiations. And my own 2007 Baroque tapestry show. Gabriella, that's the, the red ball paint I was talking about earlier. Along with these grand spaces, many in recent years, many of our curatorial departments have also developed their own small exhibition spaces to show works in the collection, drawings, textiles, prints, photographs that can't be shown on long-term basis. And we also have some medium-size exhibition galleries. And the roof garden uh, above the Wallace Wing has become a real go-to destination in recent years for installations by contemporary sculptors. This is the Jeff Koons show of 2008. And this is the current installation by Roxy Payne, an amazing, called Maelstrom. It's an amazing sort of tree-like structure that seems to have just dropped down on the roof of the museum. In the fall and early summer 
it is quite typical to find as many as 15 exhibitions and installations underway at any time. And that will certainly be the case this fall when we're featuring shows by old masters, uh, Vermeer and Votto, exhibitions of modern photography, Robert Frank, we see one of his iconic images here, exhibitions of the 18th century Chinese master, Luo Ping, uh, an exhibition of two centuries of American narrative painting, uh, with one of Bellow's iconic boxing scenes on the right, uh, George Caleb Bingham on the left, and perhaps the largest exhibition of samurai armor ever to leave Japan. Uh, we're bringing some 150 national treasures over that have never, never left Japan and will be um, obviously very spectacular. What then of the future? In recent years, as you can perhaps tell from the implicit narrative of this lecture, it has become increasingly apparent that the Met's exhibition program has, been, has become overheated. In various lectures that he de de delivered in the 1980s and 1990s, Philippe was already calling for a reduction in the number of big exhibitions. In 1994, he questioned whether the efforts to increase the number of exhibition banners on the facade reflected not so much, quote, the glow of health, as the flush of fever, end quote. And he suggested that the institution could not continue to maintain this level of activity. Yet, despite those concerns, the number of exhibitions has just grown and grown. The problem is that with so many of the museum's staff now focusing on the education program, it's very hard to put the brakes on. We seem to be caught in a vicious cycle in which our academic staff measure their own success by the exhibitions they organize, and in which our business model depends on the exhibition program to drive to attract audience to the museum. Ironically, the scale of the exhibition program is wholly disproportionate to the expectations and interests of our audience as a whole. Analysis of our audience demographics shows that our visitorship is comprised of approximately 30% local, 30% national, and 30% international. So I should have said 33, 33, 33. One third, one third, one third. 60% of our audience has never visited the museum before or only once or twice in their lives. And while 60% of our audience, of our visitors, do wander into at least one exhibition, it is clear that for the first time and international visitors, it is our permanent collections that are the reason for their visit. Only 20% of our audience, primarily local, visits the museum more than four times a year. In other words, only a tiny fraction of our audience is seeing more than a handful of our many exhibitions. As a curator within the museum, I was well aware that I was having to compete with my colleagues with their exhibitions for audience. Meanwhile, attention to our permanent collection suffers. Although recently installed areas of the museum, like our new Greek and Roman galleries, or our new American wing, which have been the subject of large capital projects, look marvelous. Far too many of our older galleries have inadequate signage and require new investment. We put much more time and effort into developing websites and audio guides for our exhibitions than we have ever done for our permanent collections. Yet, as I've just said, it is these collections that 60% of our audience primarily comes to see. The balance between exhibitions and permanent collections was one on which I was planning to focus uh, very quickly following my appointment as director. With the downturn in the economy, the need to make careful decisions becomes all the more pressing. 
Unlike most European institutions, the Met is largely self-funding. It only receives 10% of its operating budget from New York City and nothing from the state or federal government. All of the rest of its operating budget, some $200 million per year, derives from income we generate from fundraising, ticket sales, merchandise, memberships, and the like, and most importantly, from our endowment. All of our revenue streams are down in the current economy, but the most significant impact has been on our endowment, which has declined in value by about 24%, some $700 million. The consequence of this is that we will be facing significant budgetary deficits for the next few years, and we have already embarked on a very extensive cost-cutting program. Well, how will this impact the exhibitions? Last year, our stated exhibition budget was $14 million. This figure covers curatorial research and travel costs, design and installation costs, loan and registrarial costs, and marketing and attendant opening charges. But the true cost of the exhibition program is actually much higher because that figure doesn't include anything for the permanent curatorial and conservation staff who work on the exhibitions or the myriad of departments who contribute in one way or another to making our shows come, come to fruition. It doesn't include the guards guarding the exhibitions either. If you take all of this into account, then the true cost of our program is several tens of millions of dollars. Well, as I said, in recent months, we've been responding very aggressively to the financial reality. We've embarked on a radical restructuring of a number of areas of the museum, and including staff reductions. More may have to come. And as for the exhibition program, I anticipate that we will probably have to reduce the number of large loan shows that we undertake by as much as 25% in the coming years and draw more creatively on our own collections for medium-sized and smaller shows. Doing so will not be easy, and there is still much to be thought through. But the Met is a very strong institution and I trust that the change will be gradual, and that from the point of view of our audience, it will be almost imperceptible. I inherit an exhibition program from Philippe that has a number of shows on the calendar through 2012. I'm actively working with the curators to support those exhibitions, and indeed, to round out the program with the addition of other appropriate shows. And as I ponder the future, I must emphasize that I, I remain fully committed to maintaining an exhibition program that reflects the encyclopedic range of our holdings and to maintaining the balance between scholarship and accessibility that has characterized the Met's exhibitions for so long. One of the wonderful things about the Met is that great opportunities always seem to be coming up. Even in the last few months, We've been able to uh, feature uh, what has, has been presented as a, 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 a youthful work by Michelangelo, which um, was identified as a result of conservation in our, in our studios. We presented it with a tiny bit of contextual. What we're seeing is that our audience, you know, I mean, there is certainly a place for the big shows, but they also enjoy these smaller shows. Um, they're, they're more manageable. Uh, you can kind of get your head around them. So, in conclusion, I must emphasize that whatever decisions I make in the coming years, no one should have any doubt about the continuing importance of the exhibition program at the Metropolitan Museum or the importance that I personally place upon it. Our exhibitions are a crucial counterpart to the permanent collections. From a programmatic point of view, they provide an opportunity to display and study objects and artistic movements that are not represented in our collections. And they provide the contextualization of our collections 
through the loan of key objects that we could never acquire under current circumstances. From a commercial point of view, the ex exhibition program is an integral component of our business model. Exhibitions provide newsworthy items, especially when accompanied by international news, high-profile personalities, or artworks. Exhibitions provide the urgency of now, the compelling reason to go now. They generate attendance, publicity, and a positive perception of the museum's mission that in turn leads our supporters to sponsor and donate to the museum. I leave you with an image drawn from the 2002 Tapestry in the Renaissance exhibition that I organized in, sorry, in 2002 and which developed from the conversation that I had with Philippe de Montebello in my first interview in 1994 and with which I began this lecture. The show involved loans from 30 collections in more than 15 countries, including the Patrimonio Nacional here in Madrid. The exhibition exemplified all, all the strengths that the Metropolitan is able to bring to bear for such occasions. Political and curatorial contacts, funding, design, scholarship, and trained staff who can implement such ambitious installations. I trust that we shall be organizing similarly ambitious exhibitions for many years to come. Thank you very much.